it just reinforces, doesn't it, this interaction between land and sea. Islands everywhere you look. We've now drawn up in front of Gateholm. Yeah, look at it. It's amazing seeing it from the sea, actually, because it is. you get this incredible feeling of the connection of the sea and how important the sea must have been to these people. Yes. It just brings it really home to you how much the sea is a highway. The yeah. whole of the Irish Sea is sort of busy with boats all the time, yeah. connecting and um, meeting people and sharing culture. This is a central hub yeah. for Ireland, for Cornwall, for Brittany, for, you know, for the rest of West Wales. Yeah. So, you know, really, you're talking about a kind of you know, ancient motorway, really. Excellent. One of our key archaeological aims is to establish a link between the island and the fort. We've got promising signs of Iron Age buildings on both sites, but have we got proof of a connection? Phil, yesterday you said this was the trench where we got evidence of Iron Age settlement. Are you still happy with that? I am absolutely over the moon about that, Tony, because <laughs> I was right. Yeah. Um, except in that where I thought the house was has moved. <laughs> If you remember yesterday, I told you I thought that was going to be a central hearth. Yeah. It is not a central hearth. What we think now is that it is a, is a, a four-sided stone box, of which we've only got one stone. And this thing would have been possibly lined with clay and filled up with water. They're very, very common on Iron Age sites. I mean, some people use them for cooking, some people think they were used for saunas, some people also think you can use them for brewing, which is right up my street. <laughs> it's a lovely little domestic image, isn't it, that people were sitting around here eating their seafood, drinking their beer and uh, having a sauna, although presumably not all at the same time. <laughs> no, absolutely. But unlike us having our fish stew on the beach last night when we got rained upon, these people had a roundhouse. You have established that this is a roundhouse? Absolutely, because we've actually got the foundation trench of the roundhouse. And you can see with that pin in there with number yeah. 16 on it, that is the entrance. And if you look down there, the doorway is pointing directly at the entrance to the fort. And once you've got this bit in your mind, you can actually trace it coming round here on the geophysics and you can follow it round. It gets a bit fuzzy in here, but you can see it coming round here. And it gives you a roundhouse of about eight or nine metres, which is a classic size for an Iron Age roundhouse. So we need to prove the existence of an Iron Age roundhouse on the island before the end of the day. But the frequent torrential downpours are adding pressure to our ever-tightening schedule. The bad weather hasn't deterred Cassie, who's still excavating the area outside the entrance to the mainland fort. Cassie, I thought we were meant to have a road here. That looks like bedrock. Ah, well, it is bedrock. You're dead, dead straight on this. But if you look up here, we've got some slightly more rounded stones on the top. And, you know, it's just generally more warm. Whereas down that end, it's far more angular. It's where the foot traffic's been on the bedrock. They're using the bedrock as their metal surface, effectively. I must admit, Cassie, it, it does look very much like a footpath. It is very much worn. I'll buy that, you know. Excellent. Two and a half thousand years ago, Cassie's path, cut into the bedrock, would have led past a series of stone-faced banks, each topped off by a fence of woven hazel to a pair of high wooden gates. Nestled inside the fort would be at least half a dozen roundhouses. Quite a substantial and important settlement. Join Time Team on Patreon to access exclusive 3D models, masterclasses, and behind-the-scenes insights.